Uh, Dr. Kitcher, thank you so much for your time and visiting us. One of the questions we ask our guests is um, a question about the research ethics lecture series specifically. So since you're here speaking with us as part of our ethics series around research ethics, I wondered if you could help us identify some key ethical issues or what you see as key ethical issues within this context of research ethics. Well, I think most uh, of what I know about research ethics focuses on the methods through which research is done. And I think far too little emphasis is placed on the goals of research and the standards that make for good and significant research. So I guess I would see, like to see a much larger emphasis in research ethics on uh, how one recognizes those research projects that really do contribute to social good and how one institutes um, policies and uh, measures for uh, identifying such good projects of research and, uh, and bringing them to fruition. So this relates directly to the work you've been doing around the broad issues of science and society in general, yep. one of your exactly. sort of areas of exactly. philosophical expertise and interests. Are any of the ethical issues you identified as particular in research ethics um, unique or um, somehow particular to this broader context of science and society? Well, I think that there's, I think you can devise a, a sort of division of the scientific process into three sort of major stages. We can think of uh, a stage under which questions are chosen for to be addressed. You can think of there being a stage which results are uh, certified um, after experiments or research has been done. And you can think of a stage at which uh, the research is translated. So the ideal situation is in which the uh, initial set of questions that are on the research agenda are those that answer best to the needs of I would say humanity broadly construed, since I don't think that these things should be limited to a particular nation. Um, and then research gets adopted when it's uh, sufficiently uh, likely to be sound so that the benefits of going ahead outweigh the potential costs of instituting uh, measures that on the basis of faulty information. And then these results flow out naturally and beautifully into the population so that everybody who needs to have the information uh, is able to make use of it. That's a utopian ideal. And the only point I can see in ideals is to use them as diagnostic of places at which we're currently deficient and as marking out directions in which we should move. And I think that everything I say about these kinds of uh, um, ideals in my books is intended to serve that diagnostic purpose. Uh, so I want to say there are actually quite a lot of, of precise and uh, concrete questions that arise about contemporary scientific research in all of these, in all three of these uh, uh, contexts uh, about which we should be worried. Places in which I don't think we're asking the right questions, we're focusing for example in biomedical research on the needs of the very, very affluent and not enough on the needs of the very, very poor. Um, we're sometimes not, um, sometimes guilty of delaying too long um, and not accepting things that um, are very useful and valuable for people that get held up. Uh, we're at other times guilty of jumping to conclusions too quickly. And uh, I think our ways of translating research findings into policy measures are entirely inadequate. And the, the case of climate change is, uh, is a profound example of that. That's a great segue. We're, um, of course, unfortunate that we can't offer your public talk because the university is closed for the second time in 10 years. Um, but uh, it's a segue into the topic of your post talk anyway. Um, climate change, as you described, is this um, incredibly pressing issue of contemporary science and society. And yet, you were describing in the uh, precy to your talk that democratic societies have failed to take action in face of this large threat. So we've got this um, utopian sort of ideal around the sorts of questions we ought to be asking, but there's something going on um, that causes democratic societies of the sort you're describing 
to not take action in the face of these catastrophic threats or risk scenarios. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you would have said in that talk? Well, the first thing to say is that there is something going on that prevents societies uh, from uh, even getting started on this, and it's called money. Um, and it's been in invested in political candidates uh, for a sufficiently long time at a sufficiently high rate to transform the situation in the United States uh, from uh, you know, an approximate democracy into a statistical plutocracy. A statistical plutocracy is one in which the rich govern, but they, they, can't, they can't run it absolutely directly, so they, they invest in ways of increasing the chances that things will come out right. That's the statistical thing. And they're doing pretty well at the moment, and that's, that's stymied conversation United States about the reality of, of climate change, anthropogenic climate change, and what to do about it for a very long time. But even if we got beyond that, there are harder problems ahead. Uh, the first is the inevitable uncertainties of climate modeling to predict uh, local catastrophes. So it's very, very clear that there are going to be threats over the next decades and the next century to certain regions of the world, including certain regions of the United States. Uh, the Southwest is going to be subjected to very long periods of drought. Um, actually, one very interesting um, way of thinking about this is to look at uh, real estate market futures. Um, you can see where people people in the know are going to, are going to try to move to. <laughs> and, and that brings home some of the difficulties. Uh, Florida is not going to be entirely happy uh, over the next century. Uh, it's low-lying and it's likely to get inundated. The southwest is likely to get extremely hot and extremely dry. So there are going to be some very, very severe problems for certain parts of the United States. But by and large, it's very difficult to predict with any, any, any determined probability um, what's going to happen in terms of disruptions of agriculture, eruptions of new disease, disease ep epidemics, uh, social unrest, um, uh, inundations, contaminations of water supply, drought, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We do know in general that the frequency of extreme weather events is likely to increase, that that's gonna have a devastating effect economically, socially, on individual lives, and so forth. Now, turn to the next stage, and it gets even harder. How do you prevent this? We've got to do something about uh, cutting the reliance on fossil fuels um, without disrupting the local and the global economy. Um, how, does, how does that get done? You have to draw up an energy budget for the world, and then you have to decide on principles of division. And to this point, the really elementary consideration of justice comes into play. Now, let's start with thinking of the atmosphere as a sink into which a certain amount of carbon, carbon equivalent, can be uh, poured. The rich nations of the world have, through their development, used up a very, very large amount of that. There's not much left. So how do we apportion that over the next decades? The developing nations say, well, it's our turn. Bangl Bangladesh earlier this year declared that it was going to build coal-powered electrical plants on the edge of its last remaining forests. They are right on the front lines of this, because everybody knows that the Bay of Bengal is going to be one of the first things to go under in, uh, with the seas rising. So, that shows how desperate the development of these countries are. They say, look, you've, you've used up everything and more that belong to you. You can't prevent us from uh, developing. It's going to be very hard for us, but the alternatives are worse. We keep our people in poverty and, and penury forever. We'll take the chance on that. So there's a very simple argument from justice there. Even if you say, well, we didn't know what we were doing, for the last 30 years, the rich countries of the world have known what they were doing. And they've still used up, in that period, more than their share. So uh, the, the question then is, if this is the argument from justice, 
Can we politically expect the poorer parts of the world to be so blind to that argument that they will relinquish their claims? And that's why the, the problem has been so hard to solve. It's actually a very easy solution to it. And the answer is, again, it's about money. Transfers of wealth from the rich to the poor could create a situation with renewable technology. Jim Hansen tends to think it needs to be accompanied by a return to a bit of nuclear power. Other people I've talked to who, are in, um, who have followed the rapid pace of expanding technology, especially in the solar uh, area, have said to me, no, that's now outdated. To actually do it and produce enough energy uh, using wind, solar, a bit of geothermal, a bit of hydro, hydroelectric power. Um, it's going to take a huge amount of investment um, if we're going to do this worldwide, that's for sure. And it's going to mean um, a rather large change in conservation habits on the part of a large number of people. Can it be done? The simple answer is yes. Can it be done politically? Probably not. But there's a hope. And the hope comes from what I call unmasking the meaningful. It's actually getting people to think what really matters to them. And I think that um, at the heart of all of this comes the fact that we never have, many people never have serious opportunities for reflection on what really matters to them in their lives. Nations really have that opportunity. And we really need it. Because I, the optimist in me is convinced that if we all had a really serious conversation about what matters in life and what doesn't, we decide that we could sacrifice a lot of the things on which we waste money. Um, one of the things that I will point out bluntly and simply is that uh, a very bright undergraduate who took a philosophical issues of climate change seminar uh, that Evelyn Fox Keller and I held uh, a year or so back calculated that two thirds of the US military budget will do it. We can save the world for two thirds of the US military budget. Uh, with a bit of um, assistance from good conservation measures and um, uh, these things are in fact uh, in the terminology job creating I may say uh, so it can be done but we have to have I think the will to sit down and ask what really matters to us and if what really matters to us are um, you know status symbols and large and extravagant wastes of money all over the place neglect of public transportation at the cost of uh, investing in individual cars. If what really matters are um, the ability to fly many, many, many times around the world each year, then it's hopeless. But if what really matters is the future of our children and our grandchildren, which I hope and think it is, then we actually can do this. We can get out of this bind. But given the point that I started off with, the statistical plutocracy in which we live, politically, the chance for that conversation, the chance for serious policies may be too small. It's at once incredibly hopeful and optimistic and rather dire and pessimistic all at the same fell swoop. It's yeah. a rather fascinating... Well, that's what I would have said. <laughs> um, it leads me to maybe the last question I'd like to ask you now is specifically, uh, we've spent a lot of time here at the Ethics Institute thinking about the relationship between ethicists, however you define that term, and the scientists and engineers who are driving science and uh, epistemic stances in the world. So there's a question or a conflict ongoing, as you've described, between epistemic considerations and ethical ones. And to, as you say, unmask the meaningful seems to be at once to shift the norms or the values that are at work at play that people recognize as important or meaningful, and also to do that through some sort of epistemic change, a change in the way we understand knowledge and our placement in the world. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit uh, specifically for our graduate students in science and engineering. What role do you think ethicists and science and engineers play, scientists and engineers play, in, um, in this work of unmasking the meaningful? Well, hopefully collaborative. Um, 
I hope that engineers and scientists tell us about the real prospects that we can, we can use to address well-defined problems, and that ethicists tell us useful and important things about goals and how goals relate to one another and uh, the ways in which uh, goals that apparently conflict with one another can be reconciled. That's, that's fundamentally what I see going on here. And as you know, my, uh, my vision of uh, the ethical life is one that's founded in conversation that takes all people's claims seriously. And that requires a massive amount of the best factual information we can acquire. And it requires a serious effort to clarify goals and to see if we can find ways of reconciling uh, people's projects where their goals seem to clash. seems like an optimistic end. Good. Thank you, Dr. Well, Kitcher, for your I'm time. sorry I didn't get to give the talk, but I was very glad for the opportunity to talk with some of your uh, people here. It's been and a pleasure to have you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.